Hello and welcome to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Tonight for our second case we will explore a topic in palliative care. On our specialist and expert panel tonight we have Gary Logan, clinical psychologist here in Toowoomba. We have Dr John Hall, one of our experienced rural GPs from Oakey. We have Dr. Luke Gaffney, Medical Director at Toowoomba Base Hospital. And we have Karen McKellar, who's a Clinical Nurse Consultant in Palliative Care. Can we all please welcome our specialist and expert panellists. <laughs> Tonight for our case, it will be presented by Dr. Bridget Steer. And, um, it's a very interesting case, so I hope you will all make her feel very welcome. Thanks, Lucy. So, I'm Bridget. I'm a QRME registrar at the moment. I'm doing a general medical hospital term and uh, it, for an extended skill. This case is actually based on uh, hospital end of life care, but uh, there should be some aspects of it that are useful to. Well, well, everyone, I hope, and uh, hopefully some points that can be addressed by the panellists at the end for uh, rural GPs. So the case is Mr JM. He, I was going to say is, he was, being a palliative care case, um, was a 67-year-old farmer uh, that lived rurally on a farm uh, about 40 minutes outside of Surat in the near Roma. So initially he presented to his GP with uh, shortness of breath as his presenting complaint. This had been increasing quite quickly over two weeks and um, further questioning he'd had some fatigue and weight loss over the last couple of months and uh, decreased exercise tolerance as well. So especially in the last two weeks his shortness of breath had affected him so much that he'd gone from being a, an active farmer to barely being able to do his uh, perform his ADLs around the house. He had a past medical history of smoking, but otherwise healthy and no regular medications. As part of uh, the workup, uh, the GP performed a chest X-ray, uh, which is here on the screen. So that shows uh, a concerning right upper lobe mass uh, with likely some associated consolidation in the right upper lobe and bilateral pleural effusions. Obviously, this was uh, concerning uh, with any sort of central mass, central lung mass for a malignancy and was referred on for a CT in Roma. The CT, there's a, a shot of the CT, one of the shots of the CT, which shows, uh, confirms that it's a, a right upper lobe mass and it also showed that there were bilateral large pleural effusions and also something that wasn't seen on the chest X-ray, which is a large pericardial effusion, which you can see there around uh, the cardiac shadow there. At this stage, he was uh, transferred to Toowoomba Hospital, uh, being a likely new diagnosis metastatic malignancy for both uh, tissue diagnosis, so it can get on treating whatever it is, and also for um, management since he did have this large pericardial effusion that was something that needed to be urgently um, assessed and, and managed. First thing when he arrived in uh, Toowoomba Hospital there was a long discussion with the patient and then later on that day with the family about investigating for this malignancy what, what sort of tests would be involved and the invasiveness of those tests and they also um, talked about the pericardial effusion and what that meant for treating that as well with uh, the procedure of per a pericardial tap and, and drain put in. This, um, as any patient, and I'm sure we already dealt with it in the, in the previous case with the, with the prostate, but uh, obviously that leads to people thinking, how long do I have? What does this mean if this is cancer? And it was communicated to him that with the pericardial effusion that if it is cancer, this is likely recur and would, uh, was a poor sign of um, what his prognosis might be. 
So after those discussions, uh, the patient and also the family decided that um, with the pericardial effusion and um, the prognosis associated with such a significant deterioration in the last couple of weeks that they wouldn't actually go looking for what this cancer was and they wouldn't be looking into, um, into treating it. So he remained at Toowoomba Hospital under a general medicine team. There was the, uh, a consulting palliative care service at the time uh, which was involved. And as soon as that uh, management decision had been made by the family, that raised certain questions about where to go from here. So being at Toowoomba, he's obviously not from Toowoomba. Most of his family is in rural uh, Queensland. So does he stay at Toowoomba? Does he, do we try and get him stepped down to Roma Hospital and uh, access the medical services there? Or also would we be able to get him home with uh, community nurse visits and um, palliative care nurse visits as well from, hopefully from Roma? Again, consulting with the family and um, providing information about his deterioration, it was decided to stay at Toowoomba Hospital uh, going home was very quickly ruled out, not so much because community nurses wouldn't be able to help, but by this stage not being able to perform its ADLs, that puts a lot of stress on, on the family to help out the patient. And um, that was something both he, that he didn't want to, to put the strain on them at the time. Uh, ongoing, um, when he arrived in hospital, he'd already been arranged to have a, an echocardiogram to assess the pericardial effusion, which uh, went ahead, I guess, more for a, um, interest in to see how, how actually, um, how big it was. And it showed that it was, the heart was essentially floating in this uh, fluid in the, in the pericardium. And he was acutely tamponati, well, subacutely, I guess, over the last couple of weeks to um, last couple of days and progressively over a couple of days developed very cold peripheries as his output was limited by that tamponade. Again, uh, more discussions with the family about what these investigations mean and what we're seeing and uh, we switched to, I guess, end of life care in hospitals. So the, we ceased all his non-essential medications non-essential being anything that's not going to treat symptoms or uh, his day-to-day uh, -day needs and, and help his comfort. Thinking about whether or not he might be, be too weak or not conscious enough to swallow, converting all the medications to the subcutaneous route. And really at this stage, we're making sure that we're managing all his symptoms and uh, certainly not you know, it's never an aim to, to hasten any death, but not prolong life as well and make that remaining um, life as comfortable as possible. So looking at pain relief, uh, medications for agitation, for any respiratory secretions and nausea or vomiting. He'd initially had an uh, intercostal catheter put in when he arrived in Toowoomba Hospital for the um, large pericardial effusions, and that was taken out. Cannula was taken out, and um, the observations were ceased. The family was around a lot, as you may have uh, guessed from how I've been talking about this case, and if they weren't present, then at, at the time on ward round, we were updating them daily as well. Uh, Mr JM passed away in Toowoomba Hospital about two days later. So while this is a very sad case, you know, it was barely three weeks from the time of his um, acute, well, his subacute symptom onset to his passing away, the, I believe that the, the communication with the family along the way provided the, the information that the patient and the family needed to make decisions. And this, I think, was a very, good death and that was a very good outcome for this particular case. So that was my case. Uh, the aspects I was thinking might come up would be 
with our Toowoomba Hospital palliative care team. We're um, a bit of an advertisement as to what what we provide and what um, we can help people out with more rurally. And I guess also what, what our rural colleagues need from everyone and, and what we've come across when we've had less support in the hospital. Yes. Shall I start that off there? <laughs> thanks very much, Bridget. OK, thanks. Well, why don't we start um, once again with you, John, as a rural GP. If this uh, was your patient, um, how, how would you feel and, and what would be going on sort of in the background with this sort of case? Look, we would manage this sort of case very, very, very similarly. Um, I think... Um, I think in the country, again, that closer relationship with the hospital sometimes gives us uh, a bit more freedom than, than a, say, a Metro GP to, to be um, more involved in that end-of-life care than, than you would be if you're in, um, in sort of siloed private practice in the city. So in, in that sense, uh, again, rural GPs um, uh, are expected and, and in, in some cases have to do this type of care because there's, there's not, not other options and often it is. Um, the best place for the family and for the relatives for that patient to be palliated locally. Um, our, our, aim, um, our aim where we are in Oakey is to try as best we can to get them into the community, if, if that's a possibility, but ov obviously we, we give the patient and the family all the options, um, including, I mean, we're close enough to Toowoomba to include in those options Toowoomba Hospital or Hospice. Um, home at, or, or in the hospital at Oakey, so they, they have quite quite a few options. But um, and, uh, we would we would very similarly manage this case um, rurally, and it's I guess one of one of the areas or subspecialties of medicine where where we can um, we can do you know almost the entirety of this care with advice um, in in rural areas. Uh, we we often. Um, liaise very closely over the phone with our palliative care and our medical specialists. Um, so, you know, again, you can provide that higher level of specialist type care um, as a generalist by being sort of the agent for, for other people as well. So I think that's that's part of the model of, of generalist and, and rural care. And as I said, I think um, these types of cases uh, we do, uh, they're bread and butter for a lot of country guys. And, um, um, you yeah, know, we try and uh, mirror that type of management. Great. Mm. Um, and if I can ask you, Luke, sort of about um, the local area service provision in this area, um, such as that experienced by by this patient in the case. Well, look, I think Bridges presented a, uh, very well what is essentially a very sad case, and, and I think what John said is very true. Uh, it is a shame. I mean, assuming you make assumptions about patients' wishes, and, and we always do try to get people home if we can, and, and it is difficult. I think we live in a decentralised rural uh, health service district and and Surat, you've picked one of the hardest places to, to try and support someone if they wanted to be at home. As far as I'm aware, there's no hospital in Surat. The closest would probably be Roma. If there is a hospital, it's probably a multi-purpose health facility in Surat. So not a lot of uh, services locally for this poor fellow. Similarly, his time frame is short and trying to support this fellow at home is difficult. But what can Toowoomba provide? Well, I guess uh, palliative care services are growing and uh, Toowoomba is, uh, I guess, quite fortunate in having quite a lot of services around, but in terms of outreach for more rural areas, a lot of it is just by way of telephone support or video conferencing and telehealth. Uh, at Toowoomba itself, we have um, a, a palliative care service that incorporates an inpatient service, outpatient clinics, as well as an outreach service for the immediate area of Toowoomba. Um, we're very fortunate to have a very large number of GPs in, in, in Toowoomba area that are very comfortable and very experienced with providing very good comprehensive palliative care. And I think that the best palliative care is usually provided by GPs rather than in tertiary or, or larger centres, mainly because of that longitudinal and very special relationships that I think GPs have with their patients and families. And that's what patients are looking for. They're looking for security in times of difficulty and GPs can provide that, I think, a lot more than a, 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 at the pointy end of the service, which is a, a, a specialist palliative care service. Um, 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think the palliative approach is very important. I think that the secret to palliative care is just being, being willing to, to put it out there and go on the journey with the patient and recognising that they're going through something that everybody has to go through at some point or another, but it's a very difficult time, both for the patient and for the family, and, and being willing to be available and supportive and, uh, you know, um, even though it's not something that everyone's naturally comfortable with, you can have a go. And, and, and sitting down and listening to people is, is probably the greatest gift you can give, I think, a lot of the time in palliative care and, and uh, just being very patient and, and compassionate. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask you, Karen, um, in cases like these, mm. sort of the nursing care aspect becomes um, very important as mm. well. Can you talk through sort of how you would become involved in a case like this? Um, I think in cases like this, from a nursing perspective, from my perspective in my role, it's about working with the, um, the general medical teams and the nursing staff on the general medical wards to, I guess, assist with like, you know, how best to change um, medications and manage symptoms and working with nursing staff, I guess, who are more aimed at, by working in a general hospital, it's about trying to fix people and make people better. So it's very routine based in terms of we've got to do people's obs and then we've got to act on it and trying to change people's mindsets that when somebody's dying, it's actually more about that, I guess, basic nursing care, making sure they're comfortable, making sure they're clean um, and spending time with the families and, and listening to the families and communicating clearly with the families rather than, for example, putting a blood pressure cuff on and doing their blood pressure and then and trying to say to people, what are you going to do with those things when you've got a reading that's going to be abnormal? We expect it to be abnormal. You've got a dying patient. Um, why are we doing it if we're not going to act on that or change that? So I think it's supporting nursing staff to maybe rethink how they look after people and, and change their focus from the technical side of nursing to the more, I guess, compassionate side and the, just the nurturing side of nursing and just looking after people. Um, and giving time to families and giving time to patients, um, which is difficult in a in a busy ward. So I guess sometimes my role is to provide some of that time to patients and families, where the nursing staff on the busy medical wards maybe don't get the opportunity so much um, by the nature of what they're doing, and making sure that we're open and honest and have those frank discussions with families, although they're not easy discussions. Mm -hmm. And I guess assisting in some of that sometimes is to try and make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody's comfortable with where this is, this is going. Um, for the registrars out there sort of watching and learning, is it really hard? Do we get <laughs> caught up in wanting to do something? And is that a skill that we need to learn, you know, as practitioners to de-prescribe, to, you know, remove, you know, life-saving measures? I, th I, think, I think maybe from my perspective as a, as a nurse, um, we need to recognise that dying's normal. Mm. and stop trying to maybe, I'm not <laughs> trying to save everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and recognising that dying's OK. Mm. Somebody dying is not a bad outcome. In fact, if it's a good death, it can be a, a good outcome. Mm. And sometimes actually where it goes horribly wrong with, with people dying mm. is where we're maybe reluctant to recognise that that's where this is going. So we don't have those discussions. We don't have those discussions with the families or the patients and then we end up in a crisis situation where somebody's dying and then we're suddenly trying to say to people, well, what do you want us to do? At a time when it's emotionally wrought, you're asking families, do you want us to pr provide resources to this patient? Do you want us to try and save them? Whereas if actually those discussions had opened up days or weeks or months prior to that, that dying time could be a much more peaceful and dignified than it sometimes is. And I think it's about, I think, learning that they're hard conversations, but if you can try and initiate some of those difficult conversations, in the long run, it actually brings about good outcomes. Mm. Mm. There's never a right time to have no. conversations, there? No, and they're hard, they're hard. It's not mm. that I'm saying they're easy conversations to have, but unfortunately, within healthcare, they're conversations that we have to have I think we're fighting um, here uh, also a community per a perception and, and a community attitudes towards dying that that are, are probably need to mature a bit mm. as well. And I think a lot of that back pressure comes from families, um, often ambivalent families that um, have guilt and other emotions, and they're trying to 
play that out in these last times and, and often then they become overprotective and want to do more in mm. these situations, which, mm. which then I think with junior doctors and registrars, they feel, you know, they want to help, they want to be part of that, they want to keep trying to fix the problem. But, and as doctors too, I think we feel a bit disempowered and, and lose control if, if we're choosing to step out of that and not be the person that's going to come in and fix it all and, and, and solve everything. Whereas um, understanding that sometimes letting someone die and helping them die peacefully is actually fixing and is actually solving and, is, and can be quite complex and can be involved to do it properly. So um, I think as uh, the community needs to sort of um, change, I think a lot of our public perceptions around you know, what we see on TV and, and, and I think also probably medically over the years we've created an expectation in, in the community that you know, things can be fixed and we can do lots of things. Um, um, and so there's, a, there's this community perception that, um, you know, that their, their loved ones shouldn't be dying and that there, there should be something in our technological world where, where we should be able to fix people. So I think, um, you know, communicating that is difficult. And like you said, there's no easy time. Often if you bring in that conversation too early, they all say, well, so you, you're telling me I'm dying. Um, you know, that's what we experience. And in our nursing home, we have a policy where we have that conversation with everybody on admission and we mm. say to them, we're having this conversation with everybody on admission. I'm not saying I think you're sick. I'm saying this is an important thing. And I think it actually starts in the general practice. Mm. It starts in your middle-aged patients, bringing up the topics around advanced health directives and end-of-life care planning early so that people don't get shocked by it, having the conversation when they're well, when they're really well, so that, that, that we can start to change those community mindsets and perceptions that, that you know, um, uh, the end-of-life, you know, that the, the we can save everybody. And even from a health economic point of view, we're spending you know, about a third of the health budget in the last year of people's lives. Um, and often that's in over-investigation, over-treatment, where we could actually be affecting better outcomes, uh, better patient-focused outcomes by, by actually doing less and doing it better. So I think that's, that's you know, that's a, this is a huge sort of, I, th I think, ethical issue that, that needs to be started, a conversation that needs to be had in the community as much as medicine. So I was going to ask um, the two of you, actually, I, I've often heard um, it said um, to involve palliative care early. Mm. When's early? Is there too early and is there too late and what's oh, good? Look, I, I don't want to be talking to school kids. <laughs> that's what you about. I think, you know, if you, if, you, if you think, I guess there's lots of tools that will help you with this. Um, we've made some packs at Toowoomba Hospital which are quite useful in terms of prompting discussions and it's got a tool called the SPICT tool, which is from the NHS and it's, it's about identifying patients with chronic diseases. Uh, I mean, cancer is the obvious one. If you've got a metastatic incurable cancer, you're going to die from it, um, you know, perhaps with the exception of prostate cancer. But, you know, uh, um, but then there's certainly, uh, there's the foot of the bed test. You walk past someone and you think, oh my God, they look really sick. This person's not well. Their life expectancy is limited. Um, it's entirely appropriate to refer for discussions around planning for the future. Same with, uh, there's that, what they call the surprise question. Would you be surprised if this patient died in the next 12 months? If the answer is no, then maybe you should be referring to palliative care or initiating a discussion yourself around planning for the future. Planning, advanced care planning is a hot topic at the moment, and I think that it's slowly gaining traction in the community. I really like John's point about uh, as a policy on admission, you have the conversation with a, with a patient and their family. Patients go into nursing homes because they are frail and, and, and they are going to die in, at, at some point in the not too distant future. People in nursing homes have a limited life expectancy and that's the nature of nursing homes. But when you raise that topic with patients and their families, they're often quite shocked to, to, to be faced with it. But you lose nothing by raising it. And I think that, um, you know, especially if it's done sensitively and, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in the right setting, um, with enough time to discuss what it all means, mm. you make tremendous gains. That's Don't it, you agree? Yeah. And I was going to say, I think the thing that shocked me, obviously I've been in Australia that long, is that coming here and I was just saying in the interval that I walked into a patient who had a metastatic lung cancer and had been diagnosed a year ago and I was asked to go and see her and I walked in and said, I'm a palliative care nurse. And she burst into tears and she sobbed. She said, that means I'm dying. And after the conversation, it was like, but you were dying a year ago at diagnosis. So me coming into the room hasn't altered that. But maybe we can talk about things. And at the end of the consultation, she was crying. She said, because it's great to meet you. 
But having come from the UK, we used to routinely get referrals from people at the day of diagnosis. We've got somebody to come into clinic with metastatic cancer. <coughs> Will you come and see them at the same time? Mm. And it may be that we went and saw them and they didn't want to know and we'd walk away, but they always had that contact detail. And I found it very strange since I've been here that the referrals to palliative care seem to come so late in the day very often because I guess I'm used to working with it much earlier. So I think at any point, and I think sometimes even at diagnosis, it's not too early. Certainly in people that are going to have maybe tricky symptoms or a difficult journey through that, um, that it's never too early to have another person. And it makes it less scary when at the end of the day when the renal physicians or the cardiac physicians or the oncologists run out of tricks, mm. palliative care becomes much less scary and the patients don't feel abandoned. Lizzie, can I ask Gary a question? Do you find a lot of patients struggle with changing from that sort of heroic beating cancer narrative to the acceptance, I'm going to die from this narrative? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And the, um, like I think the idea that you can prepare them with information to not experience shock might be a little unrealistic because it's just not how the mind deals with this. Mm. You know, so the mind will protect itself from this for as long as it can hold out. You know, and so uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, like I was, I was uh, with a guy only recently who was 74, advanced prostate cancer. <clears throat> the referral came, look, not sure, it doesn't have a long time, but he's, you know, can you spend some time with this guy? And, you know, and he was very, you know, kind of um, upbeat and, and uh, even though all the information was that you have, like, weeks, he was still talking about, I can beat this. You know, and uh, and he died like about a week, ten days later, mm. um, and and um, and it was interesting that through the course of the, of the conversation that we had, like we had about an hour and a half together, he and I, and <clears throat> it, it it was an interesting experience and humbling and and um, you know, kind of a beautiful experience in some ways. And it, and it kind of reminded me again and again and again of, of, of something I learnt when I was very young. You know, I walked into my first oncology unit when I was like 22 as a, as a student priest and, and walked in and saw this woman who, whose eyes were full with, with, with distress and a husband and a son who didn't know what to do. And as soon as they saw, saw me walk in, turned around and walked out and she burst into tears and she said, I can't talk to them, they won't talk to me, they're terrified. And so I sat there, I knew nothing, it was my first day, I was 22, you know. But I learned something really important, that, that, that what it really, like this, this work takes, uh, you know, two really critical things in, in my understanding. One is courage, mm. and the other one's kindness. You know, that, that courage to sit there and go, look, I can't alter this, but I'm not afraid of it either. Mm. And I'm not afraid, when I say I'm not afraid, but I'm not afraid of your fear. And I'm not afraid of your sadness. And I'm not afraid to go to that place in myself and attune to you. And that's a kind of a term we use in psychology, which is this, this <laughs> idea of not just sitting there and understanding, but attuning to the, the emotional experience. And so, you know, I cried with this man. Mm. And I cried first. <laughs> Because he was telling me his story, and like like Bridget telling me her story, and and there's another person that I think really, you know, like I'm I'm feeling good, which is Bridget. Like who's caring for Bridget in this? Because like that to attune with this man takes a tremendous empathy and openness and courage. And and then when the family goes, like who's looking after you? And what happens to all of that? raise that because I was going to ask about debriefing yeah, um, for right. the people involved in these cases. Um, how should we debrief? Well, I think Who the psychologists really, I mean, like, I, I'm surprised mm. too that, that we're not called on more often, mm. you know, because it's, it's kind of, uh, we've, we've, we've got that time. I think time's the big thing. Like, there's two mm. ways to spell the word love, you know, and, and one of them is T-I-M-E. Mm. You know, and, and, and we, because we're scientists and we live in the world of science, we, we, we get a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. And so in psychology, we talk about unconditional positive regard. What a jawbreaker. We could just say love. <laughs> 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 we 
Right, but, it, but it's a scientifically kind of okay way to say mm. that I'm going to sit here in a vulnerable space with you mm. and I'm going to be vulnerable with you and I'm not going to kind of... I, I can give you information, but I know that's not really what you need. What you need is another person to stand here in mm. this lonely place. And I think my experience is the biggest crushing of psychological phenomena in this palliative experience is the intense aloneness. Mm. And, and, and I've had so many people say to me, you know, the aloneness hit me most when I was telling my friend and he looked away. Mm. And it's interesting, isn't it? I think I, I'll pick up on a couple of things. First of all, I think what you said about psychology involvement is very important. And we have a psychologist as part of our team, mm -hmm. um, not for ourselves but for the patients, mm. but we do also incorporate regular... I guess, multidisciplinary meetings where we have the opportunity to discuss patients but also tricky experiences and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we do make sure that we debrief regularly and socialise regularly because it does take a toll and mm -hmm. I think all of us have had moments where you've had a, had a teary mm -hmm. on the ward and that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I do often wonder about GPs and how GPs mm -hmm. who've gone on the journey so much more longitudinally, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure that they experience grief as well and how do you debrief that experience? Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult. But in terms of that aloneness, I see that a lot. Mm. That patience that they really are just a lot of the fear and the and the horribleness. them see that you're feeling your feelings and that it's see we make it safe for them to feel we, we make it safe for the family to be confused to, to have whatever feeling is going whatever you know experience is happening and it's sometimes I, t I, I tell little stories and myths because I think they're very valuable and, and one is of the donkey and, and, and thoroughbreds and, and like in a storm if you've got thoroughbreds corralled they'll get so frightened they'll race around and they'll hurt themselves which I see this in clients and, and their families. They get so distressed, they don't know what to do. But if you put a donkey in there, the donkey just drops its head and it weathers the storm and, and, and the thoroughbreds just run round and round it and they keep them safe. And, and, I, and I think where the donkey is, <laughs> is to be the donkey. Mm. I'm not mm. doing anything. The storm doesn't frighten me. Mm. And I'm not going to panic. And, and when you're in, in this space with me, my stability or my, my lack of fear of this and my ability to be clear or calm or whatever it is that how we say it, you can circle this. And, 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 I, and I think, and I, I often then work with the families. Like I, I have clients whose partner, you know, or child died two, three years ago. And they're still circling the donkey. Mm. And that gets less often. Initially, they circle the donkey weekly or, or more, you know, and, and, and gradually becomes every second month. And then and gradually, of course, they don't need it at all. But mm. I, I think one of the things that's happening um, is that the gradual development of specialists, like us sitting here as expert panels, is scary. You know, to be expert at, at, at sitting with with distress is worrisome. Like, you know, we, we, the danger is that we say, I'm the expert and so other people de-skill. Mm. Um, what do you recommend then for um, trainees, you know, registrars and GPs in terms of debriefing or managing their own emotional attachment to the, you know, patient that they're looking after and then coping with that? Well, grief. I think the, the peer, like, you know, no one often understands you as well as those who are going through it with you, mm. you know, and, and um, but I think though it, it is also valuable to talk to someone who's totally outside the team, mm. Mm. you know, like, the, say, the confidential, let, let's say the clinical psychologist, it doesn't have to be. Mm. Look, it could be your hairdresser, really. I mean, the, the critical ingredients are that you trust them, 
that they're trustworthy, they honour that trust, that they, that they are not afraid of what's going on, that you can be honest. Now, as I say, de-skilling means it's not common that the hairdresser probably is up for the task. But, um, but yeah, like a psychologist, uh, yeah, although I don't want to underestimate, you know, hairdressers, you know. I don't, I don't have be... much cause to go to the hairdresser. No, no, <laughs> I'm not a huge, uh, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, like, um, just because you don't think you need it, you know, like, mm. um, I, I sit with a lot of people who don't think they need help. And, and I'm not sure whether I'm good at talking them into it <laughs> or in that space they, they are given permission to feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, what do you think? Oh, look, I think this is a, this is a huge area. Um, but some, of, some of my most harrowing experiences as a rural GP have been palliative care. And, it, and one of them in particular was palliative care that, from the patient's perspective, went really well. But um, I, it was a younger guy who was palliating at home who I empathised with completely because he had daughters my, the, the same age as my daughters and was a very similar age and was a very difficult case in that he was mm -hmm. a strapping young fellow that took a lot of, a lot of tweaking of medication and, and a lot of medication. So, and we were working very closely with the palliative care team with that one. Uh, and it went well, but I think because of um, the, the combination of being a busy GP, being on call at the hospital, having a very hectic day, doing a lot of this care in between patients and after hours at night um, over the course of probably three weeks where this guy was dying at home was extremely exhausting, mm. um, but, but emotionally exhausting. And I think Gary's touched mm. on a point where you probably don't have the insight in the busyness of a, of a hectic job how much it's affecting you. So this particular case, um, I, um, I broke down a couple of weeks later when, when it finally I, I, got, I went away for a weekend and, you know, was doing something different and it really hit me. Um, so I think um, um, the importance of looking after ourselves and making sure that we do talk it through. I, I don't know that there would have been a better way of dealing with that for me, but I think there is some value in being aware um, and, um, and I think talking with your colleagues, talking with, with your loved ones and, and, and debriefing in that sense. Um, I, I'm not sure about formal debriefing. I mean, I've heard mixed stories about the value of formal debriefing, and I think the research is 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 um, is a bit like that as well. But I, I think, like Gary's saying, I think just having the insight into the fact that we've got to look after ourselves. And I think, um, look, I think that the the thing that really affects rural GPs is is often the fact that you're on your own in the country and you, you've got multiple other responsibilities as well. So it's not, as, it's not easy to just to drop tools. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's an important point. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I see massive parallels between palliative care and obstetrics. Uh, and, and you get that when you're in the bush because you, know, you might be delivering a baby and then going to the palliative care ward but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge privilege that the patients give us to be a part of a, a natural, nice birth. Equally, it's a huge privilege to be part of a natural, nice death. And I think um, the, the concept of being that person, one of, the, one of the early things I got taught about obstetrics was to do it properly when it's going naturally is to sit on a stool in the corner and just let it happen. Um, and, and I think equally, there, there's a... There's a there's obviously that concept in palliative care of being that support but not being the focus. And I think that's the challenge for doctors as well as often where the focus, and this is true patient-centred care where mm. they really do become the focus. And I think that's challenging and a bit disempowering for us. Mm. But it's having insight into all of that as we go along the journey and looking after ourselves. If I can, um, just with you again, Gary, if we bring it back to the patient, in this case, it is another case of a patient that's had a very rapid escalation of um, events, you know, it was an unexpected diagnosis with a very poor prognosis and a very rapid progression. Sort of how can we support them through that process um, and, and be there for them in that way? I've spoken a bit before, but... Well, it is, I mean, like I think what we're saying, like that ability to be present, mm. and um, I, I might use a few jargon words, and I know they might have kind of sort of connotations, but the, the idea of being present, like not not thinking, 
you know, but just being there, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, I suppose that that donkey metaphor, and but it does take time, and I can I can empathise with 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 the GP. There has so many pressing demands. I don't know how you guys do it actually. Like, you know, really, we get we get a full hour, and even sometimes I feel pressed. You know, so time, if it's there. Uh, otherwise, I think it is about drawing in and, and sharing, you know, sharing that load and making sure you're drawing on the supports and sharing mm -hmm. each other's professional, you know, kind of insights and, and capacities and, and not... and being careful of being isolated and being the, I have to shoulder this all, mm -hmm. you know, and getting, and getting trapped or ensnared in an identification with expert. We've got to be really careful about those labels, mm -hmm. you know, because they can really trap us. You know, and and we need to be able to hop out of there and go. You know, I, I I I can't do all of this, and I need to be able to draw on others. I need to be able to talk to my loved ones as well. And and I think coming back to that 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 courage. And and I think that you said before too. How what can we do to help young GPs or all, all GPs? And I think that I don't know if you guys are familiar with mindfulness meditations, and they, they're in the mm -hmm. jargon as well, but. In very brief, what, what that means is the ability to stay present to the here and now experience okay. without mm. judging it. Mm. That's what you need. To be in this moment, if that's a painful emotion, then I don't judge that. That's what's happening in this here and now moment. And if it's a confused thought that needs explanation and talk, well, that's, that's being present to this here and now. If it's, a, if it's to touch a hand, that's the... It, so it's this... Trusting yourself and really believing in trusting and letting go of expert, letting go. It's almost like what you said about being patient. So it's like we fall out of the picture and it's really being fully present and, th and then trusting that, look, between now and when I finish this hour with this person, I'm not going to get any better at what I do. I need to now just trust it and be mm -hmm. fully present as I can. And, and that, that's, you know, that's that really letting go <coughs> and being there. I know there's a lot of jargon words there, but... And so I suppose you said before, too, what can we do to help... You know, I, look, really, I think that, you know, all people should learn to meditate. You know, because meditation is about helping yourself learn how to be present in this moment. And if you can't be present to yourself, you, look, you really won't. You're kidding yourself if you think. If you can't be present to your own painful feelings, you're kidding yourself to think you can be present to theirs. Mm. You'll find expert to hide in. Mm. If I can change tone quickly <coughs> now and just ask um, some of the practicalities with regard to dying at home. Mm. Um, so for GPs and registrars that may be called upon to write the certificate and so on, what is the processes there? Yes, so mm. that is a question that does come up. Um, so it's important to understand that if a death is an expected death, it's okay to not call the police or the ambulance in the middle of the night. It's okay to, to and it's important that you have this conversation with people. If you've got somebody who you're expecting to die, die at home, having a chat with the people who are looking after that person at home, because obviously this is a, a big thing to go through, not everyone's comfortable going through it, but um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's one of the parts of the job that can be quite tricky is, is getting the phone call in the middle of the night, oh, mum's just died. If the family are OK with it, it's OK to allow that person to sit there overnight. And it might be that they're in their own bed and you say, OK, well, just, you know, let her rest there overnight and in the morning, you know, I can come out there. Now, some people aren't OK with that and you might have to go out there in the middle of the night. And that's tricky because you know, depending on your relationship with the patient, that might be something that you're comfortable with or it might be something that you're not. Yeah. Um, you don't... The police don't need to be called. Um, uh, the implications of police being involved in the death are that it might be unexpected and so they might want to investigate things. We will often, for the patients that we are associated with that we're sending home to die, we'll often send a letter with them saying that this is a this patient is known to our service, they have this condition and and uh, their death is, we are expecting them to die at home so that there's no big fiasco because we have had a few fiascos over time. Um, I think uh, it, it's difficult. In, in some of the larger centres, uh, such as Brisbane, there are nursing services that do provide 24-hour care. And so they might... One example is Karuna. Karuna is a, a Buddhist-based philosophy um, 
service which is very good at palliative care and they have a lot of um, support and volunteers in Brisbane and so they have a lot of capability to provide people to stay overnight if there's symptoms that are uncontrolled they can go have a nurse go out and give medications during the night. Unfortunately in Toowoomba and, and in our district we don't have that capability so a lot of it is about spending time with families in advance and building up their capacity and their resilience so that they know what medications they can give um, perhaps training somebody who can give subcutaneous medications if need be. We try to simplify things as much yeah. as we can before sending people home so that mm. there's a limited armamentarium of medications that they can use with a written plan and plenty of supplies. Um, but it is difficult. Dying at home is, um, uh, with, with comfort and with dignity is a hard thing to achieve. But, you know, with the right time and the right planning, what do you think? I think... I guess the thing that, I, that always springs to mind is that we all seem to assume, well not all assume, but there's a big expectation that people should want to die at home and that's the right place for people to be and that families can do all the care and support. And I think it's important that we recognise that it's not always feasible that anybody dying at home, it's a massive strain on whatever family they do have. And often as well, families, patients will say, I want to die at home. I don't know, three, six months before they die. But that actual dying process often isn't how they expect it to be and they get scary symptoms and, and that, you know, families feel reassured that at the end of the day, calling the ambulance and bringing them back into hospital, even if it means them passing away in an ED, is not an inappropriate thing to do. And that's OK. Making sure they've got ARPs at home so if, uh, you know, for example, QAS do get called, they're not going in there and trying to... Mm. resuscitate somebody, you know, make, just making sure those practical things are in place so that in a crisis situation at home, which, which does happen, however much planning you put in sometimes, mm. that if the ambulance gets called, which is the thing that often happens, that they're not doing you know, things that really aren't appropriate at that stage in somebody's mm. life and can try and support the families. Um, but simplifying things and, yeah, putting as much support... And I, think, I guess the difficult thing with home is the support is limited. Um, however much we want to try and achieve it, there's certainly within Toowoomba an hour a day of nursing that we can put in, 23 hours that are left down to family and relatives and mm. the practicalities of that are that it's hard. Mm. Can we quickly ask if there are any questions from our studio audience? Sorry, me again. I just wanted to put in a plug for rural hospitals that maintain the acute care capability in the hospitals. You know, at Clifton, it's a fantastic place for people to die, the local people to die, because you can move from residential care near the, near the hospital through high care and into an acute hospital. And we often have people who will come all the way through and it allows them to um, get really high-level nursing care. And, and that's just such a great asset to the town mm -hmm. to allow the family to be near their member um, and people have wonderful deaths and are very happy with, with the way it everybody's happy. Um, so I just wanted to, to put in a plug that it, there's a bit of a movement to have rural hospitals either downshift to aged care facilities or maybe even shuttle together, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge loss to families under those circumstances. And I, I don't know, I, I know John's had a lot of experience with rural hospitals, and uh, it's a shame, to, I, I find it's a shame to see it lose it. And, it's it's the aged care, it's the acute care hospital that, that actually turns out to be that great facility when you need higher level nursing. And the only way you can retain higher level nursing, I think, in a lot of country towns is is that they're supposed to be able to do acute care as well. And uh, uh, and then I guess the other plug I wanted to put in was that I find that rural hospitals tend to avoid that, that push towards futile care because it's not available in country towns. <laughs> uh, but I'm interested in your, your thoughts on futile care at this point, I mean, John touched on it earlier, um, and I think it's something that isn't part of rural medicine so much uh, because of the lack of access. Can I just elaborate on that? I think one of the beauties of working in a rural town is, yeah, you've got that acute hospital care, but what we've been able to achieve from time to time in Oki is actually giving the patient a bit of a smorgasbord of options with palliative care. Because we've had, because there's a bit of redundancy in staffing in rural hospitals, we, I never actually say that publicly, but to, to actually staff a rural hospital for the peaks and the troughs, there's, there's all, often a bit of redundancy, which means sometimes you are going to have 
nursing staff and people that are able to come out into the community. So we've often had acute nurses from the hospital go into the community, help us manage drivers and things at night when they're on shift, which you might be able to do from a busy city hospital, mm -hmm. um, and, and have that, that option where they can, you know, we often sell it to them as, you know, this is not you're going home to die, this is you've got the hospital as an option and if you change your mind, you can come back there. If you stay there for a week and you want to go back home, you can. You know, if you want to come in for some respite, if you want to stay in the hospital, you can. So we sort of sell them the suite and say, you know, it's your choice, we've got open access, there's no visiting hours, there's no limitations. So I think sometimes in, in that country context, if you've got the right people around you, you can actually um, give people a few more options. So um, yeah, no, it's certainly uh, achievable. I think I certainly agree with that. I think in the smaller towns, you get you, your hospital, your community nurses are often go above and beyond maybe what their their roles will be in order to try and facilitate some because they're small communities, people know people. So I think sometimes actually patients get, albeit a better deal, out in the smaller communities because of that sense of community. Um, that sometimes it is made far more possible for them to stay at home than it necessarily is in a in a larger centre. One of the practical things I think that Karen touched on before and I think is really important to remember in rural hospitals is because we're generalists and it's not a specialist unit, um, switching mindsets can be an issue. So you've got someone who's in an acute hospital bed sitting next to someone who's being managed for acute pneumonia and the nurses are intensely doing OBS and then they're switching to the next patient who they're not meant to do OBS on. I think. Um, that that's it, your communication as a doctor to your staff and educating your staff as much as anything is really important. So I've had situations where they've been taking regular BSLs on palliative care patients if, they ha if that hasn't been explicitly told, you know, explicitly explained. So I think um, it's it's really it's it's a different thing when you're in a generalist hospital as it is to a specialist palliative care unit. You've got to make sure that you're communicating to the whole team and understanding that you're trying to achieve a lot of different specialties under one roof for want of a better word. This has been a fascinating discussion but unfortunately we are out of time. Can we all please thank our presenter tonight and our specialist and expert panellists. <laughs> and don't forget we will have one more grand rounds um, in a month's time, April the 30th. We hope to see you then and of course further grand rounds throughout the year. Keep looking at our website to keep posted. Thank you and good night.